Greetings. This is Angry Ilocana in American Colonized Hawaii. The month, which is is satire to the Filipino American History Month, but today I am confronting racism in Hawaii from a Filipinx perspective. To begin, I wanted to contextualize where Filipinos in Hawaii stand uh, from the history of the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. And this was perpetrated by white American missionary descendants and businessmen who overthrew Queen Liliuokalani in order to use the Hawaiian lands for their own economic purposes, but through the support of President McKinley at the time of 1893-1894, although to 1898 when the illegal annexation took place. But Hawaii was incredibly important because of its position in the middle of the Pacific to be used as a refueling station and a rest and recreation station for American militaries to be patrolling the Pacific waters in addition to Asian locations in Southeast Asia and North Asia and East Asia. But before the military took over Hawaii, the Hawaiian lands were used for self-sufficiency, for food production, such as Pearl Harbor, which was seen as the key to the Pacific by General Schofield, among the major proponents for t t taking Hawaii for its military purpose. But Pearl Harbor was used um, before that. It was called Ke Avalau o Pu'uloa by the Kanaka Maoli people as a estuary to grow seafoods. As you can see, this is the ocean waters going into the bays of Keavalao o Pu'uloa, one of the many bays of this pearl here. And you can imagine the fish ponds, the different types of seafoods that were um, harvested and grown naturally through the Kanaka Maui's methods of fish pond creation in addition to other types of uh, aquaculture practices that they had. But when the U.S. military took over this place, particularly in 1887 Bayonet Constitution, forcing King Kalakaua to sign uh, the Bayonet Constitution um, and therefore um, annexing this special part of Oahu Island to the military, really started the buildup of this place into a Superfund site, which it is today a highly polluted area. The military has major navy ships and infrastructures here. Um, a lot of the place have all kind of poisons in the water. Uh, it is not edible anymore. Um, and so it's an example of the destruction of militarized use of indigenous lands. The connection between Hawaiians own military occupation is connected to the Philippines. Kapiolani Park is a major popular area that we might see today in terms of Diamond Head. But at the foot of this mountain, it's a big open field that was once used by American soldiers um, in, to create Camp McKinley. It was a temporary barracks for soldiers coming from San Francisco and then set, uh, again using this place as a resting zone on their way to the Philippines during the Spanish-American War. And for our Filipino history buffs, we know that the Spanish-American War was between the Filipino natives and the Americans working together to take out the Spanish, who was colonizing Hawaii, I'm sorry, Phil Philippines for the past uh, 500, 400 something years. And so, the Spanish-American War was a time when Americans was using Hawaii as a rest and recreation zone on their way to help the Filipinos for that war. But at the end of the Spanish-American War, the Americans decided that they did not want to leave the Philippines, that they wanted to be the new colonizer of the Philippines. And this angered the Filipino independence fighters are Filipino nationalists that thought that they would be free after the Spanish left. But they had to then fight the American military aggression, causing the creation of another war in the Philippines called the Filipino-American War, which was considered 
another brutal war, this very violent picture here. I apologize for people to see this horrendous picture of American troops leering over a trough of Filipino dead bodies. And this is another evidence of the atrocities of the Filipino-American War and how Hawaii already being part of the transit of American troops to Southeast Asia, Hawaii was being used as part of the stepping stone to send these troops over to the Philippines to commit this genocide against the Filipino people. And so you can imagine that the devastation of basically two wars, Spanish-American War and then the Filipino-American War, devastated the economic and the political infrastructure of the Philippines. And so the Filipinos became one among many ethnic groups that began to um, be recruited by the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association, who are again part of the American missionary business classes that overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy. And then the HSPA had already established uh, plantations um, in the 1840s, 1850s, but they began to intensify after the overthrow. Uh, Chinese immigrants had already been in Hawaii. Japanese also had already been in Hawaii before 1898. But when the Filipino-American War happened and after that, uh, more Filipinos began to be recruited to work in the plantations. Around 1906 is the celebrated year of our, the first mass arrival of Filipinos, but there is arguments and evidence that Filipinos were also coming in before that. But in any case, these, there are many different ethnic groups from Asia to Pacific, Americas, and Europe that were being imported to Hawaii or coming to Hawaii to work in the racially hierarchical plantations. And it was racially hierarchical because the uh, this is William Little Lee, who was the uh, chief justice of the Hawaiian kingdom in the 1850s. And he drafted the Masters and Servants Act, which basically defines the relationship between masters who were the employers and servants, which were considered the workers. And basically, the masters could tell the workers what to do, um, and they had to, the workers had to abide by those rules because it was written into contract. If the workers left, um, they could be either uh, thrown into jail and um, beaten or or um, if they were ran away, they would have to be brought back and work more hours. Um, and so because of this power that masters had over workers, there was a lot of exploitation in terms of taking advantage of workers who might have been illiterate not understanding the contracts, laws, the contents of that contract, or the ways in which uh, different language speakers from the early times of the implementation of the Masters and Servants Act, the Maka Ainana or the working class Hawaiians who would be subjected to changed contract laws or contract terms without their awareness and then being forced to do more than they, ex than they were expecting, then causing them to be punished if they chose to fight or run away. When different Asian immigrants come in, again, of course, those the contracts were not written in their language. And so there were stories of Chinese immigrants like Salai, who was a Chinese worker who was whipped by his boss, but the courts eventually sided with the boss. Salai actually died um, after the whippings as he was left outside in the, in the rains you know, fell upon him, and so he died a few days later. However, the court sided with his boss, saying that it was the worker's fault, it was Salai's fault for dying because he was outside. But you can see this ways in which immigrants and just the working class were very much um, exploited by the masters or by the employers under this law. And William Little Lee is a chief justice lawyer. He's an American lawyer coming from the American South. Now coming into, uh, bringing in his own customs in which the racial, the slavery plantations was part of his upbringing and background. And he's bringing that set of values and societal structure to the Hawaiian kingdom. In the Hawaiian kingdom, however, you were also, they were also known to be anti-slavery because 
there were missionaries that were part of the abolitionist movements who didn't believe in slavery. And so they tried to make sure that those types of slave type um, treatment would not be present in Hawaii. We have a constitution that says that everyone should be treated fairly. And so the notion of a contract seemed to equalize people. It seemed to make workers not slaves because they would still be under a contract and therefore paid by some wage. Um, but there was still these uh, situations where workers would exact power over their workers in terms of changing the terms of contract, um, engaging in whipping, because there was even, you know, there's documented cases of lunas or overseers, uh, which were plantation middlemen, plantation um, middle managers that would be supervising workers on horses and also sometimes carrying whips. So there was that, you know, sort of social hierarchy in the Hawaiian plantation society. And it was established because of this type of economic system that was being implemented. And another evidence of racial hierarchy in Hawaii was the bongo tags, which were ID tags that each of the plantation workers wore around their neck. It would have a specific shape that would correlate to a specific ethnic identity. And the ethnic identities would then be paid according to a different pay standard. And usually the people that were higher up in the pay standard were whiter skin workers like Portuguese or workers that were in the plantations for a longer time like Hawaiians and Chinese. Um, and, and, and then the ones that were paid less were newer immigrants. So at first it was the Japanese. And then as the Japanese assimilated and the Filipinos came to be the new set of immigrants, then the Filipinos were at the bottom. And so this continued, this, this racial hierarchy was part of trying to divide the workers' interests from each other um, and to keep the uh, racial hierarchy in place so the workers would not unite and, cre and, and, and um, band together if there would be a strike. But... The Filipinos and the Japanese um, and even the Hawaiians have a history of striking on their own during different times of the plantation history. The Hawaiians were the first to strike on Kauai. And then eventually uh, when the Chinese came aboard and the Japanese came to Hawaii, then they also began to witness the unjust working conditions and the exploitation of the workers. And they began to strike. But the thing about it was that they were striking either for their own ethnic group or for their own plantation camp. Um, and then only when the Japanese and, and the Filipinos started to see the dynamic of how one group would strike, but another group of workers would come in to sabotage that strike, uh, the work, the union or the workers organizing, the workers organizers the, began to see the importance of communicating between the different ethnic camps. So the Japanese and Filipinos on different Oahu camps began to work together. Um, among major Filipino lab, uh, labor organizer was Pablo Mandlapit, who was very a uh, part of communicating with Japanese um, workers, and they ha expanded strikes in different camps in Waiea, Waipahu, Eva, Wailua, Kahuku. In the um, 1924 in Kauai, that was another significant strike that was um, important for Filipino history in Hawaii, and Basically, again, Filipinos would be migrating to Hawaii in waves. And because Philippines is so ethnic, ethnically diverse, there's different language groups, um, just because they come from the Philippines, it didn't mean that they understood each other or they felt the same way about things. So the Hanapepe strike really was sparked by Visayan workers who were on that island already for a couple of years, maybe had experience observing the unjust working conditions. And so they had organized a strike on the Machiavelli plantation where they worked. Um, and so uh, there was a new set of workers from the Philippines and they were from the Ilocos and they came um, to the Machiavelli plantation and the Visayan workers asked them to join. 
but the Ilocanos didn't understand because they're new and they just wanted to work. And so this created a skirmish where the Ibisayans um, engaged in some kind of fight that led them to take the Ilocanos hostage. This caused the police to arrive and there was a kind of, uh, you know, a way to squell the tensions and, and to sort of, uh, after a while, disperse the workers. But eventually there were these shots fired, killing 14 Filipino workers and three police. And there's been a recent research case trying to understand what, who started that massacre and what happened. Um, there's different issues that the uh, police department had deputy shooters that were up on the hill that shot and killed the people, the Filipino workers. And the Filipino workers could really not have done that much damage because they didn't have guns in, in, in their hands, only bats and whatnot, and maybe one pistol. But then the killings of 14 people seemed to be very much a lot in, in that moment. And so people think that it was on the side of the police that has uh, triggered this killing, the mass killing. In any case, Pablo Manlapit was, again, he was on a different island, but he observed and um, learned about this situation and he realized how the planters were really taking advantage and trying to pit the different Filipino groups, the Tagalogs and the Visayans and the Ilocanos. And also, you know, he was trying to speak to uh, the Filipino uh, labor commissioner in the Philippines, Cayetano Ligot, to help the Filipinos that were being exploited. But there was this complicity on the part of you know, the Philippine government's labor commissioner to um, have the Filipinos be more docile to the Hawaii sugar planters. Because, um, again, at the time, the labor of these Filipino workers was to, you know, also help the Philippines economically as a trade partner, perhaps, for the for the Hawaii and, and for Philippines. And so the governments also didn't want to support the, 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 the demands of the workers for better working conditions. And so, um, you know, Pablo Manlapit really had a lot of work to organize people with different organizers on each island. In um, There was a time when Pablo Manlapit was exiled from Hawaii for his organizing. And he was he went to California and he connected with Filipino labor organizers in uh, Stockton and, and, and different places there where they were organizing, too, um, in the ter in the depression, post-depression era. And so with that connection and perhaps he learned skills and he would come back to Hawaii in 1934 to organize on Maui. And there was a group called Bebora Luvaminda that was being organized by a man named Antonio Fagel. Um, and this was basically a Filipino specific group. And it was considered the last ethnic strike um, and, and the Filipinos were on strike because they were the cane cutters, which is the lowest level of job and um, in, in the plantation in Pu'unene. And they were being forced to get paid less, even less. And the, 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 the Luna was um, saying that they were going to get paid less. And so that forced them to have a strike. Um, and so eventually they were able to win some concessions for a couple of years. But... Uh, it didn't stay. Um, the the victory, the compensation that they required was eventually overseen, um, overpowered by, you know, uh, a new set of policies by that plantation. Either bringing in new set of workers who would accept, you know, lower paid work, and therefore the demands of 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 the Vibarlovaminda fell away. Um, and and because of that, Epifanio, I'm sorry, um, Antonio Fagel decided to join up with this budding interracial organizing that was happening under the International Longshore Workers Union. And this was something that Harry Kamoku, who was a Hawaiian labor organizer from Hilo, uh, started to push in terms of building uh, an interracial union. At first, he started with the longshore workers, but he started to organize uh, with other workers in the factories and in the fields. And then this union began to expand to other islands and really building connections with workers across all sectors of agricultural production in order to stop work and therefore pressure the plantation owners to listen to their demands for better working conditions, better pay, 
and also for a treatment of equality because the agricultural plantation system was connected to agricultural workers in the continental US and they were and the people in the continental US were getting paid a certain wage that was higher than that the workers in Hawaii was getting paid but yet the production and the teamwork necessary uh, to take place in Hawaii and California was necessary in order for the, the trade to occur uh, smoothly and so uh, ILWU workers and uh, one of their demands was to have fair wages um, like that of the continental US counterpart and so we come today in the transition from agriculture to tourism um, and and there are a lot of discussions about how while these are a little bit different industries agriculture was very much uh, field-based work um, working in the sun or working in monotonous factories um, or shift you know loading things on docks and whatnot to tourism which was a whole different work environment where you have these visitors coming and there is a hotel with relatively nice kind of um, beautiful work environments is a way to appeal to the visitors and to have a relaxing time and enjoy the culture of Hawaii um, and so it's different but people consider tourism to still have uh, a plantation-like environment. This is something that Honani Trask has written about with regards to the way that Hawaiian culture is packaged in the tourism to be in the tourism economy to be prostituted by to visitors, and the way in which Hawaii has been uh, the Hawaiian culture has been con configured or disfigured to have this welcoming. Uh, kind of attitude or, or, or mood that allows visitors to come here and to ha have a sense of entitlement to Hawaiian culture, to Hawaiian lands, to feel like they can just take over and, you know, go here and there without any respect to the Hawaiian people and the sacred sites and other types of uh, the cultural practices that they hold dear to their cultural identity. Um, and the, the thing about it is that the workers that are in the tourism plantations continue to be people who either are descendants of the plantation era or new immigrants um, and largely from the Philippines or Micronesia or even um, uh, rural China. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to transition that in the 1950s, uh, was when the transition uh, from the agriculture to tourism began to turn. And it was because the radical labor organizing in the 1930s and the 40s caught the attention of anti-communist ideolo ideologues in the U.S. Senate, such as um, Senator McCarthy. And they began to crack down on labor organizing in the continental U.S., but also this affected Hawaii as a territory at the time of the United States. And so this caused a lot of labor organizers or anybody who's sympathetic to workers' rights to be profiled as communists and to be subjected to either imprisonment or red baiting, which is a lot of um, demonization of people and blacklisting of people. Um, and so a lot of the labor organizers and the radical labor organizers went underground. And so there was a group of people in Hawaii that were targeted as radical and they were subjected to this uh, hearing by the Committee of Un-American Activities um, and they were brought to trial and it was called the Smith Act, under the Smith Act. And these were the Hawaii Seven, which were the seven individuals that were seen as sympathetic to workers organizing into labor unions. Um, and so uh, people that were uh, one of some of the people that were under this Hawaii Seven um, group that was taken to trial was the Reinekes, Eiko Reinecke and John Reinecke, and they were represented by Har Harriet Boslog and, and um, Attorney Meyer Simons. These are the lawyers that represented workers uh, af after they were taken to jail when they were engaged in strikes in the 30s and the 40s. And this was another case that they took on, uh, the case of the Hawaii 7. Eventually, the Hawaii 7 was set free uh, from their charge because of the representation by Boslog. But it goes to show how it really created a culture of fear 
this red baiting created a culture of fear and a demonization of unions and 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 workers rights in Hawaii and what happened then as a result of this radical labor organizing going underground underground you also had this other wave of plantation descendants integrating into the settler power structure so this was um kind of a shift in the power structure of Hawaii that in the territories era from the 30s to the 40s this was when you had the big five you know missionary business class that were white people that was controlling the government of Hawaii um, the big five corporations like Amfac and Matson and Alexander and Baldwin Castle and Cook etc but now you see the big five shifting and the government um, being open to having plantation descendants, Japanese and Chinese and Hawaiians and even eventually Filipinos to join into government positions and become governors and even U.S. congressmen. And so this was seen in as, as very... Um, this was seen as very progressive at the time because um, a lot of these people were people that were formerly oppressed in Hawaii from Hawaiians to Asians and they were seen as the community um, having a new opportunity right to to change their conditions and to have a place in in government to perhaps make the new rules for Hawaii and this was seen as the democratic revolution in 1954 and then the constitution of Hawaii that radically changed also again in 1978 um, but it was also seen as a civil rights act in Hawaii, a civil rights progressive movement in Hawaii and also in the continental United States because a lot of the American congressmen didn't want to see Chinese or Hawaiians or Asians um, in the U.S. Congress because especially in the early, the first, I think, American, uh, Hawaiian-based congressman to go to U.S. Congress was... Hiram Fong, and he was a Chinese man from Hawaii. And so he was, you know, running for Congress and, and a lot of the Southern U.S. congressmen didn't want to see a quote-unquote Oriental as their peer in Congress. And so it was also, you know, revolutionary and radical to have a man of color, an Asian man of color into that political chair. Um, uh, and so that is, you know, an example of how Hawaii's settler colonial political economy at the time, which is a plantation based economy, turning multicultural because now you had people of color becoming part of that political economic power structure. And for Filipinos, we had Ben Cayetano, who became the first Filipino governor of Hawaii. But also we also had a, he also had a precedent of all of these other um, um, Hawaiian and Asian political leaders before him, right, setting the stage to create this multicultural settler state. Um, what was incredibly, however, intense was the way that as people of color entered into the settler state of Hawaii, which was, again, transitioning from plantations but moving closer towards tourism, was the way that the, the people in power wouldn't pay attention to Hawaiian sovereignty struggles that continue to be pushed. Um, again, looking back to the history of the illegal overthrow, the fact that Hawaiian people wanted their sovereignty and how all of those demands were being complicated and suppressed as more people started to come to Hawaii, as the plantation industry grew in Hawaii. And then as we had this you know, new wave of power um, in which plantation descendants joining you know, this, this plantation economy, tourism economy, and so this is a picture that represents a time um, during the Rice v. Cayetano case. And it's a painting on artwork by Kevai Kaliko. And it's a piece called Benocide in 2000. And this was written about by Dean Saranoyo in one of his articles. But this piece is very troubling because it shows what seems to be Ben Cayetano for the picture Benocide. And he is 
he has a, his hand in a rope and he's hanging a dark man in a malo, which is representative of a Kanaka Maoli or a native, uh, a, a rural native man in traditional um, wear. But you also see Ben Cayetano staring at who seems to be a holy guy um, carrying an American flag and also a pig like man basically fondling the butt of this um, white guy. And so the Dean Tarnio talks about how Ben is looking to, which seems to be Governor Burns, who is the governor that seemed to open up the power structure to the plantation descendants to come into power. And, and instead of looking at the Hawaiian people and their struggle, Ben Caetano is instead looking at Governor Burns, the head of the settler structure. Um, and so this is and, and the, the reason for this painting is in response to Rice v. Cayetano, which was a case in which a Haole man from the Big Island is suing the Office of Hawaiian Affairs because he is not allowed to vote for the trustees of OHA. But the, um, and, and Rice was claiming that it's racial discrimination. Um, however, OHA was saying that only the people that could vote was people who were at least 50% Hawaiian, blood quantum wise. And so this again was attacked by Rice's lawyers that that's again another form of racial definition. And so, you know, that's against the uh, 14th Amendment, which is against racial discrimination. And so this really changed and, and pushed back a lot of the work of Hawaiian sovereignty organizers who created and who you know, utilize a lot of the federal recognition, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs uh, laws to support Hawaiian people to recover and to protect some of the resources and cultural identity as the people, Hawaiian people, were going through colonization, under settler colonization, under the plantation economy, under the multicultural settler state. But this Rice v. Cayetano case basically rolled back a lot of their progressive action, allowing non-Hawaiians to then vote for OHA trustees. And, we, and so it's really a contentious issue even today. But that case happened under Cayetano's administration in the state. And, and this particular um, picture paints the picture of how, you know, the state of Hawaii really didn't protect Hawaiian rights. It didn't understand how to protect Hawaiian rights. Instead, was defining Hawaiians according to racial uh, issues. But Hawaiian issues are not racial. It's about indigenous sovereignty issues, which is precedes a lot of the kind of racial structuring that Western colonial governments imposes upon peoples and places. Um, and so this is the context of this picture, and this kind of exemplifies the problem of multicultural settler colonialism, that people of color um, have been assimilating and entering into this Western settler colonial power structure that continues to be oppressive and extractive of um, indigenous peoples, lands and cultures and, and rights. And so the question is, you know, what would happen if Filipinos stopped looking to white settler colonialism to understand their place in indigenous places like Hawaii, but to actually listen and learn from the Kanaka Maoli experiences of their fight for sovereignty. What would that mean for Filipinos and our own experiences? I also wanted to say that even before Ben Cayetano became governor, in the 1960s and the 70s, this is again during the transition towards tourism, that Hawaii's lands, which were previously rural under the plantation era, now becomes open for real estate and tourism and becomes um, former like small towns and older plantation camp communities become eyed by developers in order to redevelop into subdivisions or to revitalize into more tourist friendly locations. So among those sites are Kalama Valley, which is a major site uh, that really sparked the Hawaiian Renaissance in the 1960s and 70s. Basically, Bishop Estate owns land in the eastern part of Honolulu. And it's currently, at the time, rural and pig farmers and Hawaiian kuleana lands. 
and uh, just small town families, farmer families. And so Bishop Estate wants to turn that whole valley into a subdivision for either professionals or new second home buyers from the U.S. mainland. And so this sparks a fight among the rural farmers not wanting to be evicted. And this creates a movement, an anti-eviction movement that sparks other types of anti-eviction movements or other anti-eviction movements are happening in Chinatown, in Ota Camp, Waipahu, Waihole, Waikane, different parts of the island are, and many places, other places are up in arms about these evictions and how it's affecting Hawaiian people, but also old time plantation people communities and um, and how they were being subjected to uh, eviction and um, you know basically devalued by the state as they are no longer productive as to as plantation economy has dwindled and gone down and so this tourism industry is the new game in town and if you weren't playing that game then you would be erased by the society and so this became a major site of organizing and social movements that that is the foundation of the hawaiian renaissance uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s and it was incredibly it was hawaiian as well as different multi-ethnic groups coming from the plantation communities oh these are pictures this is of kalama valley people um, refusing to leave a house that was subjected to, to bulldoze. This is a picture of Pete Tagalog, who is a Filipino trying to protect Ota Camp, Waipahu, which is a Filipino camp, and it was being eyed by a Japanese developer that wanted to take over that land to rebuild and revitalize that community. But these people didn't want to leave because they didn't have any other place to go. And so Pete Tagalog advocated for them. This is a picture of elderly people, of um, Hawaiian, Japanese, Filipino, and even Haole, and just supporters from all over the areas uh, supporting these elder, elderly people from being evicted from their Chinatown homes. Um, again, because Chinatown was seen as an urban blight, and it was going to be, um, again, bulldozed and redeveloped to be more tourist-friendly. But you have, again, these movements and actions sparking all across the island during the 60s and the 70s. This is a picture of Waihole Waikane and the communities there um, protesting the developments uh, in that area as well. So a part of the situation today is that the tourism and the military economy continues to be um, the major economic drivers for the state. 40% of Filipinos work in the tourism industry, but as you know, we all know that COVID-19 has really exposed the fragility of this type of industry because it's, you know, interrupted travel and also it created a lot of danger around moving and um, the workers as well. And, um, and, and this affected a lot of Filipino communities in addition to local communities um, that depend on the tourism in industry, the Hawaiian communities, uh, you know, and the fact that, again, many of the working class from the plantations they basically transition to tourism. So it's a lot of these, the people of Hawaii have been affected by COVID-19 and the closing of hotels and whatnot. Um, and so, and this presentation is about a Filipino perspective. And so, you know, something that I've been thinking about is how can the Filipino working class be part of planning for resilient island economies and not dependent on tourism? And this is a very hard question because Filipinos are tied to the tourism industry for their livelihood, especially if they are part of the tourism industry. Not everybody, not all Filipinos work in tourism, but 40% of them do. And so it is a challenge to, for them to, to consider you know, supporting resilient island economies. And there are different examples around um, agriculture, food production, and, and, and fishing, and other types of sustainable practices that are very much connected to the Hawaiian communities that continue to do um, land-based, aina-based type of um, food and, and livelihood because that they've been connected to the land because they're from here. But a lot of these um, immigrant and, and also local folks that have 
you know, transitioned or had then been brought into the plantation and now the tourism industries, it's hard for them because they have been dependent upon the settler economic structure in Hawaii. However, I think, you know, having these conversations with the working class, especially with the fact that many of the workers for these hotels have been treated as disposable workers, that they've been, you know, forced to be unemployed for the past six months. And it's only recently, like yesterday, that the state of Hawaii has opened up tourism. And um, it says, and, and it's been talking with a lot of the tourism managers, the Hawaii Visitors Authority, um, Hawaii Tourism Authority, I'm sorry, and um, working with the hotel, you know, managers. But the union, the Local 5 union, talks about how they haven't really talked to the workers and to the unions themselves about how can workers have a safe place to go back to? Can the workers be guaranteed their jobs back? There's a campaign um, for community members to support Bill 80, which is to ensure that workers get their jobs back if the hotels open up again. Um, and they will have PPE and they will also have um, a safe workplace for them as well as for the guests and having you know strict types of policies and having the employers of the hotels make sure that they have these things in place for everybody's safety to prevent uh, the spread of COVID. And so there's a lot of uncertainty about if the hotel employee employers are going to set that up for the hotel workers. Um, and so, you know, this kind of treatment that the workers get, I think, goes back again to the Masters and Servants Act, right? How the master's employers can do whatever they like. They have this contract. Are you going to work? Okay, well, you, just, you do what I say and you just work and do what the contract says. But there seems to be no voice or no listening on the, uh, on, of the voice of the workers. Um, and I think it's this history that we need to remember and working class voices need to be part of a conversation regarding just transition, which is a climate justice term about how do we transition from these types of industries that are damaging or unsustainable or fragile, right, or insecure, and towards industries that are more resilient, that are, are more abundant and, and secure for, our, for the people. And working class people who have been part of these uh, externally dependent economies need to be part of that conversation. Um, and they need to be brought in as stakeholders as well. And another important issue is also the military, which is, I would say, probably worse than tourism in Hawaii in terms of the morality of this institution and the damage that this institution does in terms of the types of storage of weaponry and who knows what types of chemicals um, that they're storing and nuclear weapons that they're storing in um, Hawaii, but also the damage that they do when they engage in war and violence in other parts of the world and the instability of that and how Filipinos know about that because their whole generational ex experience since the Spanish-American War to the Filipino-American War has been impact impacted by war and the, the reverberations of that is still present in our community and how we are still struggling um, as displaced people and as people dealing with the side effect, the historical trauma of those wars. In any case, the military continues to be a very uh, economic presence in Hawaii and it continues to occupy Hawaiian lands, Kanaka Maoli lands. The lands are being used to train U.S. Uh, servicemen um, and, and how these servicemen are not just training in Hawaii to stay, but they're training to go and fight in different wars in Asia, in the Middle East. And sometimes they do joint training and they travel to the Philippines or other parts of the Pacific. And so the Philippines is also under a very dire political situation under a president that is uh, participating in human rights violations and concerns against indigenous people in the Philippines, as well as working urban poor. And so there's a lot of issues of U.S. military or U.S. tax dollars being funneled to support military aid to the Philippines and to arm people like President Duterte. And he had recently these anti-terror bills and other types of laws to intensify military 
presence and strategy during the COVID-19 pandemic instead of providing food or providing a strategy to help the people that are um, dependent upon work. But then when COVID closes all types of movement, like the jeepneys and the transportation, it really puts these families without any income and therefore um, in hunger and in dire, you know, living situations. And so um, there's a major issue here with the ways in which militarization um, is affecting Hawaii and how the militarization of Hawaii is, again, still continuing and part of uh, this, this overall system of militarization in the Asia Pacific, as well as in the Philippines. But I, I, I believe that what's happening in Hawaii um, and in the Philippines and in other parts of the Pacific, like Guam and Okinawa and in K Korea um, and in other places where there is this intensified militarized presence, is that it's it's the U.S. own foreign policy that is at play and under the Trump administration specifically as well, that all of these bases could be defunded if the U.S. foreign policy changes and it demilitarizes and if the U.S. Uh, policy can come to its awareness that its own security is through defunding its military as well as defunding the police and other types of ways that the U.S. government has been over-investing in this aggressive type of social and political and economic control. But I really have hope in things like the Green New Deal and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and different leaders that Bernie Sanders and whatnot that has been trying to push for a more um, de-escalated type of American foreign policy and retooling American investment into climate justice and uh, better um, in environmental security in terms of energy security that is based on renewable energies and, and jobs training towards that type of economy. Um, now, but now that we are fighting against the, uh, the Trump administration, um, you know, I think that this struggle is about, you know, tactical struggle in terms of the electoral politics is just one of the many fronts and um, of challenging the kind of fascism that we're seeing in the United States and around the world. Um, and we need to make the choice to vote for a, a new president that will give us some space and, and to work for hope and, um, and is specifically changing the types of values and the priorities of America because it affects Hawaii and it affects the Philippines and affects the world. Um, and so I think that partnerships and um, between people who have a relationship to the United States um, is important, especially people from Hawaii and also paying attention to what's happening in the United States. It's really important. Um, but also for people in Hawaii, such as the Filipinos, to also look to the history of the Hawaiians and how the settler colonial American political economy has affected this place. And how do we as Filipinos see how oppressive this power structure is um, because this power structure is part, has been part of the oppression of our own selves in the Philippines as well. This, the ways in which this militarized capitalist power structure in Hawaii had, has been in place at the same time as this militarized power structure also grew in the Philippine context, especially at the transition towards the Filipino-American War and afterward. So thank you all for listening. I hope this um, is helpful in some sense. It's just some ideas. Uh, please feel free to leave any comments in the comment box. Have a great day.